Good evening. Welcome to the University of California, San Diego's Arthur C. Clarke Center for, the hu for Human Imagination presents an evening with Andy Weir. I am Brian Keating. Thank you. I bask in Andy's reflected glow. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, we have a, a, a standout crowd, and, um, and we have uh, the opportunity to meet a very special author who is not only a very renowned and, and competent author, but he's also a UCSD alum. <laughs> notice, notice, I did not say UCSD graduate. Oh. However, <laughs> I think uh, Chancellor Kalshala is around and he can confer an honorary degree for the right price. You know, when, uh, you know, Zuckerberg didn't graduate from Harvard either and he's, given a lot of money to, to that fine institution on the East Coast, known as the UC San Diego of the East Coast, of course. And uh, Andy tells me tonight he's going to do that with his whole remaining fortune after spending what he has to spend on woodworking equipment, which is his hobby. So there probably won't be anything left. Anyway, uh, for those of you with this who are attending a Clark Center event for the first time, our, our mission is to enhance and, uh, and better the, human, uh, the understanding of human imagination by bringing together disciplines from across our campus. And these uh, divisions that we unite through interdisciplinary research and events like tonight include neurological, cognitive, artistic, social aspects, and of course, by my work, cosmological implications of human imagination. And we do that by, the inter by, by study. We're actually doing research programs as well as these programs where we like to communicate our findings with the public and bring great intellects to campus, such as Andy tonight. We have lots of events coming up in the, in the next few months. Uh, this weekend, if you're looking at, uh, to be on the East Coast uh, in Washington, D.C. this weekend, there's uh, the Unleash Imagination Conference in Washington, D.C. this weekend. In 2018, we're going to be participating in a series called Accelerating Imagination towards a human artificial intelligence utopia, not dystopia, as many of the science fiction authors here will, will uh, like to write about. And that will look at the uh, emergent relationship between humans and artificial intelligence. And uh, we could all use a little more intelligence in these times. Uh, and of course, it's also the 50th anniversary of 2001, A Space Odyssey, and the release as well, Patrick has put here, of my book entitled Losing the Nobel Prize, which you can pre-order now. It makes a great Christmas present. Uh, <laughs> and that'll come out in April, so I look forward to doing events, interviewing myself. So that'll be a nice, uh, a nice <laughs> egomaniacal event. Uh, so, and then the last thing we're going to be participating that's on the calendar so far, we have many events, and please tune into our website, our Twitter account, our Facebook account. Uh, we're also doing a symposium with the uh, Human Origins and Imagination with the Center for Academic Research and Training in Anthropogeny, which is called CARTA, which is a very, very exciting and enthralling series of events that are held on campus and slightly off campus. So that'll be in June. So check out our, po our, our website for uh, information. This, this talk is being videoed, and it will be available in a couple of weeks, uh, thanks to Patrick Coleman's crack skills. He's quite phenomenal at getting these things out. And you should also check and subscribe and like and highlight and rate our podcast, which is entitled Into the Impossible which is based on a quote by Sir Arthur C. Clarke that the only way to find out what's possible is to go a little bit into the impossible. And it's UCSD's only podcast, so I, I do encourage you to look at that. Um, so I also want to thank, as, as well, before I conclude my brief remarks, uh, the founding partner of the uh, Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination is Viasat. We have representatives, uh, uh, Steve and Sue Hart here, as well as the fantastic Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore. Where are those folks? Yeah. <laughs> That's a, a, a true gem. And they are our partner for tonight's event, so please buy multiple copies of all of Andy's books. Uh, as I say to all my students, you know, turn off your cell phones, you might get educated. And I'm now pleased to introduce my fellow co-associate director, Dr. Eric Veery. He's actually a double doctor. He never met an advanced degree that he wasn't comfortable with. Uh, he always wants to further his education. And he's going to be tonight uh, in conversation with Andy Weir, our prodigal son, who has returned to bless us with his presence. So I welcome the two of them up tonight. Thank you. Let me get the picture. Look at the picture. How do I get it? You're taking selfies. I am. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Which seat do you want? Oh, uh, you can sit over there. I've got, okay. We're really organized. <laughs> Well, it's so fabulous to have you here, Andy. And, um, and we've had just a fabulous year in, 
at, at the Clark Center with um, George R. R. Martin uh, earlier this year and Roger Penrose. Um, and to finish off December with you here is just the icing on the cake. It's really, it's I'm really icing. Because I'm so sweet. So as, uh, as many of you know who uh, hear me speak at Clark Center events, I like to talk about Arthur C. Clark. And so there you go. There exactly. Is. So please tell us a little bit about your thoughts and experiences and ideas about Arthur C. Clark. Well, um, when I was a kid, I mean, I'm, so I'm 45 years old. But strangely, I grew up reading uh, baby boomer era sci-fi novels because my father was a huge sci-fi dork, is a huge sci-fi dork still. And so he had, I don't think the man's ever thrown away a book. And so he had a bookshelf about six feet high, three feet wide, and a foot deep, jam-packed full of paperbacks that he'd accumulated over his entire life. So I grew up reading those. And they're all science fiction. So I, I mean, I, so my holy trinity, as I call them, of authors are Asimov, Heinlein, and Clark. And so there we are. one of the three. <laughs> all right. Well, and, and so, and. Uh, uh, just to be clear, I'm talking about Heinlein before you got weird. Well, <laughs> okay. fair enough. Like. Well, and, and, and there's a cutoff. That, that uh, well, and it's interesting because I, I uh, my sense of your science fiction is it's sort of good old fashioned hard science fiction. Yeah, that's what I And, I and uh, it's, it's way fun. Uh, I apologize to, to the audio people that. for bungling my microphone. Ah, uh, okay. Can she's, we get it now? She's like, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm sorry, it, it's, it kept folding in on me. Okay. Am I coming through all right? Yes. All right, good. So uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, style. You're kind of known for sciencing the heck out of, out of science the fiction. Heck. Yes, well, my the, kids are going to be out. watching this video. So oh, I'll let you, uh, uh, you use Isn't your Isn't your kid like 19? Well, I have a seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, there a we 19 go. A 19-year-old, yeah, she's heard a few <laughs> words, but yes. Yeah. Well, and uh, so. The background of science um, is a big part of what you do and part of your process, and and uh, that's certainly something we saw in the uh, in the Martian, the Martian. Yeah, it's like applause. That's right. <laughs> and so, what we'd like to talk a little bit about is your new book, uh, Artemis, and how that um, how that hard science and science approach to a lunar colony, a lunar city, uh, uh, worked out and. And my basic question for you, and we talked a little bit about this at lunch, is are you a writer or are you a scientist? <laughs> are you a scientist that tries to write or a writer that tries to do science? Where, where do you come? Because you work, think, you've worked, you get paid to do computer programming. And yeah, I was, all a, sorts. I was a computer programmer for 25 years. Uh, I always wanted to be a writer, um, but I also have always really enjoyed regular meals. So when the time came to choose a career, I went into software. When I came here, I, I went, uh, CSE was my major right from the get-go. Um, uh, I guess I would say that I'm a scientist who writes. Okay. Um, although you could hardly call me a scientist. I mean, I'm certainly knowledgeable in software. That, that's a professional level. I can, I can comfortably say I'm an expert at software engineering. Sure. But all these other disciplines that come into my books, I'm just an enthusiast. So I'm always very careful when people say, and you're an expert in orbital mechanics. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm an enthusiast. But it's easy to write about the things that you're passionate on. It's, if, you're, if you're into gardening, you could write all about plants. And if you're in, or botany. Uh -huh. If you're into, uh, if, if you're a gearhead, if you're totally into cars, you could write a lot about cars and be really accurate. Well, space happens to be the thing uh, that I'm really passionate and interested in, so that's what I write about. And you were talking about hard science fiction a moment ago. Um, the the greats, the 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 great ones. Yes. Um, there was a lot of uh, real science in their books. They sure. did their best to be realistic, and they also uh, had a positive attitude about the future and technology, uh, which we'll probably talk about a bit more. Um, but uh, one thing I've found is so. My only, what, what I really try to do is I try to write a book that I myself would like to read, right? So it's like, would I want to read this? No? Okay, well, why not? And fix it, right? Um, and for me, the most important thing in science fiction or fantasy or anything is that if you have rules, that the rules be consistent. So I don't have any problem with like soft sci-fi, space opera, whatever. So, you know, the Enterprise can go warp nine. 
fine. Like, I, I have no problem sus suspending my disbelief on that and going like, okay, you can go over 100 times the speed of light. I got no problem with that. I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna think about it. That is a thing they can do. But then there's one episode where they go from Mercury to Earth and it takes them a while. And I'm like, <laughs> Mercury is eight light minutes away from Earth. It should take you a fraction of a second at, at warp, you know, warp nine. So what, but, you know, dear Paramount, <laughs> I am thoroughly disgusted. So for me, it's all about consistency, not about scientific accuracy, right? But for me, I also, what I found is that, you know, it's the software engineer in me. The most powerful asset a software engineer can have is laziness, okay? A software engineer goes like, I don't want to ever write this routine again, so I'm going to write it in a general form so that I can use it again later over and over again. So um, as a writer, I've found that that same laziness applies. I don't want to make up a bunch of physics and then make up new physics to back up the old physics and then cover all the edge cases and stuff. If you just stick with real physics, real physics is very good at being internally consistent. <laughs> Sometimes fatally so. So uh, that, that's why, that's my particular approach. But I can very much <clears throat> enjoy space opera, fantasy, whatever, as long as the rules are consistent. Well, you did say that you that uh, you had a long aspiration to be a writer, and this is a very writerly uh, book, uh, Artemis. And of course, uh, The Martian was about uh, a middle-aged white guy on the Mars. But the protagonist in Artemis is a different kind of person. Yeah, and, she's none uh, of those things. No, that's right. <laughs> not on Mars. She's not middle-aged, she's not white, she's not guy. Right, so tell us about <laughs> writing that character and, well, and what happened with that. The protagonist, and we're gonna keep this talk spoiler free for those of you who haven't yeah. read um, Artemis. <laughs> she is apparently not keeping it spoiler free. No, I, I can vouch that that's not true. Um, but um, um, uh, the main character of Artemis is a woman named Jasmine Bashara. Everyone calls her Jazz. She was born in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and her father and her emigrated to Artemis, humanity's first off-Earth city, it's a city on the moon, uh, when she was six years old. So she's been there, and the book takes place when she's 26. So she's been in Artemis the vast majority of her life. Um, so writing her, I didn't have a problem with, uh, I, I didn't run into any problems with her being from Saudi Arabia, mm. because it's the typical story of like immigrants like coming to America, the first generation immigrants, they still have the social norms and ideals and beliefs of the old country, but their children grow up completely Americanized, right? Um, it's the same thing for Jazz. Her father is <coughs> definitely like of Saudi culture and ideals and beliefs, but she is like thoroughly a product of Artemis's culture. And Artemis is a culture that I invented, so by definition I'm right. <laughs> so, so I have no problem with her culture and her ideals and her beliefs. Uh, second off, um, there's no problem with me, uh, or in the story, doesn't run into any problems with her, um, with people's reactions to her gender or ethnicity because Artemis has, there's basically no racism or sexism. And this is not a Pollyanna, oh, we will have solved all of that by then. It's just that small communities don't really have the luxury of racism. Um, if it's a small frontier town, if you imagine like a small frontier town in like 1840, out in the Midwest somewhere and there's like 50 people and the nearest other town is like 200 miles away and you have to take a horse to get there, you, those 50 people have to work together. You can be as anti-Semitic if you want, but if the Jewish family runs the only hardware store, you're going to be interacting with them and you're gonna get to know them. So small communities don't have the luxury of racism. And um, so I'm not, in my story, I'm, and also it is 2084 is the year it takes place in. So it's much less racist in the future in general than, than it is now, just, as, just take the progression we've made and project it forward. It's not gonna be zero, but it's gonna be less. But anyway, I wasn't trying to say that that's solved. However, within the construct of Artemis, she doesn't have any problem with that. So the real challenge to writing jazz wasn't any of those uh, uh, other, uh, other aspects. It was that I'm writing a first person narration from a woman's point of view. Women and men are intellectual equals, but we still look and look at things and do things differently. And there are, and I am, did my best. You know, I, I wanted what I was, no one's gonna read this book and go, oh, Andy understands women. 
no one is actually going to say that under any circumstances. <laughs> um, but all I wanted was to get it good enough that female readers aren't jarred out of the story by, you know, something that's like, whoa, okay, that is a very not, like no woman would kind of say that or do that. And so to that end, I always did what I do when I have no idea what I'm doing, which is subject matter experts. So in this case, women. So I, I gave a copy of the manuscript right after my first draft. I gave a copy of the manuscript to every woman I knew who I could trust not to put it up on the pirate bay. Like basically everyone that I could, could trust. So my mother, my girlfriend, my editor's boss. My editor's a guy, but his boss is a woman. His assistant is a woman. The copy editor was a woman. I, so every, every, and I said, I know they usually tell you just you know, fix the grammar and spelling errors, but also please tell me about anything you see that doesn't strike true with a female first person narrative. And I took their feedback and I made changes. Most of that feedback came in in the form of um, um, Jazz's father is a, a significant character in the book. And her interactions with him are where I got most of the feedback, where, where most, of the, most of the places where the women who read it said like, no, this is not, this doesn't ring true. Because I guess I, I modeled jazz. Uh, jazz is really a reflection of me in a lot of ways. Uh, she is a screw up in the same ways that I was a screw up when I was 26. And um, so her interactions with her father are somewhat based on my interactions with mine. But it turns out that fathers and sons are very, very different than fathers and daughters. Women's relationships with their father are very different than men's relationship with their father. And so that's where the bulk of the feedback came in and I made changes accordingly. So what were your feelings about Jazz as a character? You've mentioned she has challenges, she's a screw up. In a um, lot of ways, yeah. And, but the arc of the story, you know, there's something that seems that you, you love and care about her, is that true? Well, that's what I'm shooting for. That's what I want the reader to like. I mean, it, Jazz is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, she's what you'd call kind of an anti-hero, right? She's not like the Punisher level of anti-hero, <laughs> but she's, she, um, she is extremely intelligent, like literally genius level intelligence, but she doesn't apply herself well enough. She's basically a delivery person around town, even though she could have gone into literally any field. Her father um, is a master welder, and as she was growing up in her teen years, she was his apprentice, and she grew up and he taught her everything. So he taught her a trade skill, and it was his intention for her to take over his business when he retired, but she didn't do that. She, she basically started with every advantage a person could start with, and she kind of pissed him away. And that is kind of my story from when I was 26. Mm. Is that like, you know, my dad tried everything he could to make me a functional human being. <laughs> um, I, I, I came from a, you know, middle class, you know, majority, I'm a white male. I have like every possible advantage a person could have in society and still managed to be a screw up for a long time. And I'm pretty bright. You know, but I still managed to just make bad life decisions and, and and it took me a long time to get out from under them. Now, I never did like crimes and stuff like that like <laughs> Jazz does, but so it's, everything's more magnified. But yeah, so Jazz's situation is of her own making and she, but she has a strong moral center. Now the trick with all of this is, the, the reason I did it is because I wanted a much more complex character. I want to become a better writer. I've got the full-on imposter syndrome going after having written The Martian. It's this huge success. And I'm like, I don't know what I did right. <laughs> but I would like to try to it. become a better writer. And so I want characters that are deeper, more conflicted, more complex, have more layers to them. And so I tried that with Jazz. The trick, though, is that if you go too far, if you make her too much of a screw up, You'll lose, the, you'll, you'll lose the reader. The reader will stop rooting for her. She'll go like, the reader will say like, why should I root for this person? All of her problems are of her own making. I, I don't understand why, like, I, I just want to smack her around, mm. uh, it really. And so it's a fine line that you have to walk. And I don't know if I, if I, if I did that quite right or not. And I guess time will oh, tell I mean, based well, on the feedback. We'll see that. So let's turn to science and technology, and, and I'm going to take the uh, privilege of being the speaker and talk about spacewalks. Okay. You, we talked about that's a yeah. favorite thing, and of course, the opening scene of the book is about is is as an EVA. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody? Okay, we got to do an audience check here. Who doesn't know what EVA stands for? Uh, a few 
Ooh, that's pretty a good few. audience, yeah, so. Ex, uh, it stands for uh, extravehicular activity. It's yes. any time you leave your spaceship or base or whatever. It's any time when you're out there in a space suit. So I got to challenge it because in the space, in the, the EVA, there's a scene about going into the airlock with the spacesuit on. Mm -hmm. And we know from Apollo about Luna Regolith, and you're, you're a bit of a science geek on this stuff too. What's, uh, what's on the surface of the moon and what it's all made of. Yep, and it has a special characteristic. Yes. So we were talking about this before. Do you really want to bring all that moon dust into your interior spaces in your space, uh, space colony, space city? Yes, because, um, well, basically, um, what uh, my illustrious colleague here is talking about is that um, lunar regolith dust is extremely bad for you. Um, unlike tiny little particles of dust on Earth, um, on, on Earth, little particles of rock, little dust, stuff like that gets worn down by weather and made smooth, or eventually worn down to nothing, but whatever. The, the, the things on Earth that are the size of particles of lunar dust are smooth. But lunar dust, the moon has no weather, of course, no water, no nothing going on. And so they are the same shape they were as when they were splattered out of a volcano. And so they've, they've got teeny tiny little barbs and spikes and stuff sticking out of them. And so when you breathe that, it's like asbestos to your lungs. It tears it up. I mean, you, if, if you breathe a lot of lunar dust, you, it, it's, it's, you may as well smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. Seriously. You may as well <laughs> wear an asbestos hoodie. I mean, it's, it's really very, very bad for you. And so... Um, one of the things that many people have talked about is like, well, if you're going to be regularly doing EVAs going in and out and in and out, you're going to bring this lunar dust into which is, the... Which is what happened in Apollo. Which is what happened in Apollo. Those guys were bringing lunar dust into the lamb and everything every time they came in and out, and they were just covered in the stuff. They had no idea how much it would just get all over everything. These tiny little particles that static cling basically makes them jump up onto the spacesuit, their EVA suits, and it was a mess. Um, so one solution to that, I believe you have a graphic you could hold up. I don't have it. You don't have it with you? Okay. Yeah. One solution to that is a, I don't know, a lot of different names. I, I guess you call them airlock space suits. I know them as chrysalis suits. But basically the idea is that the, um, you get into the suit through an airlock and, and through, in, through, so you're inside your pressure vessel and the suit, you open a door and the suit is attached to the outside and you kind of step into the suit and somebody closes the door and you detach and you walk off. And then when you want to come back, you do that in reverse. So the suit itself is never inside. It's just you come in and out of the suit. Okay. Good. Like the Andromeda string. There you go. Um, but the problem, uh, so the problem with that, in my opinion, and the reason I didn't go for that in, in Artemis is because um, an EVA suit is a very important piece of equipment sort of like a scuba diver's tanks and gear or a, or a skydiver's parachute and pack, and you want to give it a full inspection and check uh, between each use. And so to do that, it's a lot better to have that in inside the uh, pressure vessel with you rather than outside where it would be much harder to examine, and especially if you need to do any repairs. Now, I know your answer to that is maybe you don't need to examine it after every use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my, my solution was to say that they devised a method of, and it's shown in the book, whenever they go in, there's what they call the air cleanse, and it's just really high pressure air that blows, the, blows in all directions to push, uh, to push the regolith off. It's like, a, it's like a really, really high pressure air shower. Oh, that it sounds that a little bit like the magic cleanse to me, but I'll... I'll the magic it, cleanse, if right. you will. Uh, yes. right. Fair yes. enough. Well, so along the line of... Oh, EDA, also, uh, I, I think... <laughs> The line got removed. It got removed from the book, but because I, I couldn't work it in such that it fit. But originally, the nickname that the EVA masters called the, the air cleanse is the blowjob. <laughs> uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so being a little serious about uh, walking on the moon. Um, well, giant steps are what you take. Well, there you go. That's right. <laughs> well, and so speaking of the giant steps. <laughs> Uh, of course, Neil Armstrong died while you were writing this book. I'm sorry. And uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, you didn't cause it. But what was, but tell us about Apollo. So when, uh, when well, it was a program about that book. attempted to send men to the moon. Yes. Go on. So 
So one of the things that my wife and I liked about the book is that it's set on the moon, and we knew people, and we watched the video of them walking on the moon. Mm -hmm. So Mars, okay, we, we have this theoretical idea about what it would be like, but the moon is for real for us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what kind of captured and made it familiar, or made it, made it a possibility. So these real people did this stuff in the setting that you were talking about. And of so, course. So tell us about that. Well, what was your thought about the Apollo as you were writing this book? Well, Artemis' main economy, I mean, so the first thing I had to come up with uh, when I came up with Artemis is, why the hell would you build a city on the moon? Yeah. And, and a lot of the answers that science fiction gives, to me, fall really short. People are like, oh, they're there to mine stuff. Well, then send robots. You know, it's, it, no, it, if your robot dies, nobody cares. But people get mad if Uncle Frank dies, right? <laughs> and so send robots. Uh, or sometimes it's always like, oh, you know, they left because of population pressure on Earth. It is easier to colonize any part of Earth than it is to colonize any part of the moon. Yeah. Like, colonize the ocean, colonize the Sahara, colonize the poles. I mean, there's really, you, you would have to exhaust every part of Earth before you even consider. And then it'd probably be easier just to make more Earth, like to build upward. I mean, <laughs> I just don't, I, I don't see like going to the moon as an answer to overpopulation. Then the next thing is like, oh, well, there's an oppressive, an oppressive regime on Earth, and the people go to the moon to get away from it. it OK, if you can afford to go to the moon, you're not the oppressed. <laughs> OK? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so I came up with, uh, basically, I did this economic analysis. And I'll spare you the details, because it was 3,000 words long. And it got published in Business Insider. But basically, my theory on what the, what the price to low Earth orbit could get driven down to if the commercial space industry had functionally infinite demand. In other words, there, if there was like um, major competition to drive the price down and down and down. And I assumed like what would happen if the commercial space industry became as efficient as the commercial airline industry. And I defined efficient as fuel overhead ratio. In other words, they spend the same percentage of their total revenue on fuel as the commercial airline industry. And I worked forward from there, and I did everything in 2015 dollars, and it goes really low. Uh, it ends up being about, um, it would cost 35 bucks to put a kilogram into low Earth orbit, yeah. or about 7,000 bucks to put a human in wow. to low Earth orbit, because there's more stuff than just the mass of the human that you have to put in there. Uh, and that's in 2015 dollars. To go to the moon, uh, more math happened, and then to do a, a, a two-week vacation on the moon, which would include two weeks of travel as well, so you're gone for a month, would cost you about $70,000 in 2015 dollars. Okay, that's like, you could do that if you're middle class, but you'd be getting a second mortgage on your house, but it's within reach, and a sure. lot of people would do it. Yeah. Um, and so the foundation of Artemis, the economic basis of it, is tourism. And that's a reason to put people on the moon, because the, goal, the, the reason to put people on the moon is that people want to go to the moon. Right. And so Artemis is built very close to the, to the Tranquility Base, to the Apollo 11 landing site. It's about 40 kilometers away. Um, and they have the Apollo 11 Visitors Center, which uh, they have very strict rules that they made up for themselves, where they don't allow any, they've defined um, everything that they consider to be part of the landing site. Uh, so every footprint that remains, every, th every piece of equipment, everything. And then y nothing can be within, I think, five meters of any of that. So the Apollo 11 Visitor <coughs> Center is this, you know, is this structure that has these like bubble-like cutouts of it to stay exactly five meters away from any part of the site. But you can get up there and you can look at it. So it's like 15 feet. I don't know. It's like you could be like this far away from part of the landing site looking at it through glass. And you're in a pressurized area. You don't have to do anything. Or if you're willing to pay a little bit more, you can go out with an EVA master, and you can uh, do an EVA and look at the site from other angles. You still, they built a little one meter high barrier to make sure that no one gets in. Um, Artemis itself is 40 kilometers away from the site. You take a train to the visitor's center. And the reason for that is because um, to build Artemis, they needed to smelt anorthite, which is a mineral that's incredibly common on the moon. But anorthite is mostly found in the lunar highlands. So that's the bumpy parts of the moon. And the lunar lowlands is where the, the Mare Tranquilitatis is where Tranquility Base is. And so, and so the nearest piece of lunar highland terrain to the Apollo 11 landing site is this area 
w uh, next to, uh, it, well, kind of surrounding a crater called Moltke A. Uh, so I named that the Moltke Peninsula, and th the Moltke foothills are right next to it. And so Artemis is about three kilometers from that. So that's where they got the raw materials to build the city, and that was kind of the balance point of where it's worth where it's going. So, so I got a. Uh, we were looking at a, a globe of the moon today. Yeah. We were talking about the Apollo 11 uh, unfortunately, landing site. Everything, well, we'll get to that, but everything in Artemis, unfortunately, I, you look at a globe of the moon, everything that takes place in Artemis, the city, the Apollo 11 landing site, everything is under the tape of the equator like <laughs> that holds the two halves together because the uh, Apollo uh, 11 landing site is at like, I want to say one degree north or something like that latitude, and so it's covered up, and Artemis is like minus 0.5, or it's like 0.5 south, but anyway, go on. So tell us about this uh, little discussion you had about the, uh, the location. location of a landing site on the moon. Well, I was, uh, I have had, um, I've hung out, just made your name drop, I've hung out with Buzz Aldrin quite a lot. He liked, <laughs> he liked, he liked the Martian, he liked, and just whenever he's in, whenever we're in the same city, basically, we'll grab lunch or dinner or something like that. And we were talking, I, I don't know, we were at a table with like seven or eight other people, and uh, we were talking about the Apollo 11 site, and I'd mentioned, oh yeah, it's really close to the equator, and it's at about, uh, if you're curious, it's about um, 22 degrees um, uh, east. It's about 22 degrees east longitude. And Buzz said, well, it's 24. And I'm like, no, no it's 22, I was just looking into this. He's like, dude, I was there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So you got caught on that yeah, one. I yeah, I got caught on that one. Yeah, uh, and you know, Buzz was right. <laughs> Thank goodness. Was, he knew was, where he was going. It was 24. Yes. <laughs> Artemis is at 22, and I had gotten that so ingrained in my head that I forgot that the Apollo 11 well, on the site is at 24. Well, yeah, so yeah, don't be crossing Buzz I'm like, yeah, well, man. yeah, I know. Like, right. I really shouldn't have challenged him on uh, that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> So you had a little bit of a disparaging term for the the customers of the space tour. You know, was it uh, Jay Worth a Lot, Rich Bastard the oh, Third? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, Jay Worth a Lot, Rich Bastard the Third. Yeah. Oh, that's not a customer. So that's you're a... uh, so you've done pretty well on this uh, writing books and making movies thing. So yeah. So would you be a space tourist now? Would nope. that be... Why not? So because I'm a you're tremendous about this coward. Stuff. I, I'm. I, 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 I write about brave people, I'm not one of them. I, <laughs> I don't want to go into space, I don't want to go to the moon, don't want to go to Mars, I would not eat them on a boat, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I like being in the middle of civilization. I also don't want to live in rural Alaska, right? I like being in the middle of civilization where if I have a medical problem, an ambulance will come get me in 10 <laughs> minutes and, and where I can order pizza. So you transport. These are two different events. You transport us all out there. Yeah. But you'll, you're going to stay home. Honestly. Yeah, that's how I do it. I prefer to do my flights as I flights of change. Well, so another common theme in, uh, in uh, these two books is about food. So we learned a lot <laughs> about potatoes in, uh, on the Martian. And Poo the potatoes. fertilizer, yes, that's right. So there was a different kind of food um, because of the growing conditions on Mar on the moon. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so uh, on the moon, you, if you want to eat, um, I, uh, once again, part of that analysis, I did that economic analysis where I figured out how much it costs to put stuff down. The thing that really matters a lot in Artemis, to the, in their economy, is the price of transporting goods from Earth to the moon. And... Um, it, so, what really matters to them is the cost of a soft landed gram. You know, how much it costs to soft land a gram, not impact, you know. And um, so, the company that owns Artemis basically ships stuff there as well, and they charge for that. And so, you can get what is functionally store credit. You can say, like, I want to I prepay for, like, 5,000 <coughs> grams. I've got something that's, like, five kilograms that I want to transport from Earth uh, to Artemis, so that's 5,000 slugs, as they're called, SLG, slugs. And so, because there are people from all over the world in Artemis, rather than try to deal with like euros and yen and yuan and dollars and, and, and everything else, they said like, the people there just found that slugs was a convenient form of common trade. So it became the de facto, yet completely unregulated, monetary unit of Artemis. So everything comes down to slugs. And for reference, 
it's about six slugs to the 2015 dollar. So you could get six grams of cargo landed on the moon for one dollar, one 2015 dollar. So, so what's that in Bitcoin? You know, <laughs> wait, no, it's 16, bit, Bitcoin's right around 16,000 2017 dollars yeah. right now, which would probably be about like 18,000 2015 dollars. And so it's six slugs so you want to know how many slugs there are in one Bitcoin? Sure, It'd be sure. six times 18, about 100,000 slugs no, for a Bitcoin. I just checked. You asked. I did. So, I did. Um, um, so we were so talking about getting things food, to the surface food. and food. Yes, right, and eating food. it. Eating so the reason this is relevant is because uh, a human being will eat about 500 grams dry mass of food per day. Well, 500 grams, so if you're importing that food from Earth, that's 500 grams a day. So that means 500 slugs plus the cost of the food, which is negligible. Um, so 500 slugs is like about $80 a day you'd be paying just for the, just for the transport of the food in addition to your normal food uh, costs. And the, you know, the low level workers, the maids and toilet scrubbers and stuff of Artemis couldn't possibly afford that, right? So this is where we get what's called gunk. <laughs> now gunk is the nickname of chlorella algae. And you can grow chlorella algae, it's a real thing. You can grow it in vats of briny water and uh, it has a doubling time, you know. So it's, you can grow it very, very quickly as long as you have enough energy to put light, you know, to shine light into the vats. And energy is not a problem, Artemis has nuclear reactors. So you can manufacture enough food in a very small volume to feed the city. Artemis, you'd have no hope of growing like wheat or corn or something. They don't have anywhere near the volume inside that necessary to do that. So um, they grow this chlorella. And chlorella is particularly awesome because you can uh, adjust the nutrients in the bath and the frequencies of light and how much light hits it. And based on that, it'll either generate more protein or more sugars internally. It's just how the algae works. It's like whether or not it feels like it needs to store more energy or use more energy to, to, to grow. And so it can be perfectly balanced to human nutrition so that it has exactly the right amount of protein. And by the way, all this stuff, this is all real stuff that's been salt. Like, I, I didn't make up any of this. This is a real thing. So I, I said, like, hey, great, grow chlorella. So when I was on the East Coast swing of my book tour, I was at an event by, uh, you know, on camera being broadcast on like Facebook Live. And they're like, hey, we have some gunk for you. I'm like, <laughs> what? And, so they had gotten some chlorella. You can buy it. You can buy powdered chlorella. It's dead, you know, in that form. And so they're like, here, according to your you know, story, you just take some of this, <laughs> add a little bit of water, there you go. And it's this green, nasty crap. And I'm like, OK. OK, so it tasted like Poseidon's salty butthole. It was, <laughs> it was not good. It was, it was some of the most disgusting stuff. Actually, what it really tasted like was, OK, so for those of you who like like Japanese food, it tasted like the seaweed, you know, the nori, nori. the seaweed. But I like the taste of that. Yeah. And this was like seaweed extract, almost like really, really profoundly strong flavor of seaweed that stays in your mouth for 10 minutes after you've <laughs> swallowed it. And it, it doesn't go away. I was drinking Coke. I was like eating mints and stuff like that. And it's, it's just there. So it's revolting, which is good because I said it was in the book. But the idea. <laughs> The idea, though, is that you could is that the uh, people who eat that buy flavorant of course. from they they buy like extracts from Earth, and that weighs very little, and so they can afford that. So you can take like some gunk, mix up some gunk, and then take some like oatmeal extract, pour that in there, and mix it up, and then it will taste exactly like artificial oatmeal. So bringing <laughs> things back to Earth to a little bit, or more specifically to UCSD, uh, we I had. Uh, uh, pointed out to you uh, today that uh, UCSD has the highest number of awarded science fiction writers of any university. Like, and, uh, for, so instance, our, our for instance, David Brin so, stand, you know, sitting so we right got, there. We have David Brin right here with us and yeah. our, and our, our other Clark Center affiliates like uh, Greg Benford and Stan Robinson and Werner Vinge. So, dude, we, uh, we dude. need you. You're making the thing happen. You're keeping our on the scoreboard. I don't know. I'm not a so, graduate. Well, we'll, uh, 
Well, Brian's working the chancellor for you on that Okay, one, there we so go. We'll, uh, we'll see what he can do for you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really stunning. So the, the story is, what's in the water at UCSD that makes all these great science fiction writers? So, Don't know. Couldn't tell you. So it's really something. So to, uh, to finish that up uh, before we uh, uh, open it up for a few questions, um, again, going back to you about writing stories, and, and I was, um, we talked about this earlier, I was really touched uh, by how your fans care about you. And in particular, there's this um, uh, the story called The Egg, and um, what's really uh, striking about it is that there's all this fanfic and stuff that goes around with it. In particular, the, um, um, there's like 30 different languages that the egg is translated into and a whole series of different videos. Yeah, um, the egg is a, a short story about a thousand words long. Um, it takes like five minutes to read. Um, and uh, it's like I wrote it in 40 minutes one night in 2009 and just posted it to my site and I didn't think much of it. Um, but uh, it got really, really popular. Yeah. And it was like the first thing I wrote that really ended up like getting seen by like millions of people. It got just, like literally it just made its way all over the internet. I think part of the reason is because it was only about a thousand words long. <laughs> it's the sort of thing that you can copy and paste directly into a Facebook post and, and you can say, hey, read this story, it's really neat and it'll only take you a few minutes. It's very digestible, right? And, uh, I don't know, people, people really liked it. Well, and, it's, and it's really not the sort of thing I usually write either. It's this weird philosophical thing that has nothing to do with science fiction. <laughs> well, and it's, it's a conversation between uh, a man and God, and so I commend all of you to take a look at it. One of, the, one of the versions, one of the video versions, deviates a little bit from, from the, uh, the story itself in that the story... Um, uh, in the film, is the name of the character is Andy, <laughs> right? And, and that was, there's something that was so a maybe homage. Can, uh, uh, yeah. well, a little bit about so how this uh, this this man um, and his relationship to the universe, and maybe you can. You tell want us. me to just tell the story of yeah, the age? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you could read it. They can read it. <laughs> I mean, so tell um, the the gist but, of it. Well, the, the gist, gist of it is a guy has just died, yep. and he died in a car crash. And then he kind of wakes up in this kind of white nowhere land and he's talking to God. And God's like, and he's like, what, what happened? God's like, you died. And he's like, what, I died? And he's like, yep, you, you died. And he's like, oh, what about my wife and kids? And God's like, see, that's what I like to see right there. You just died and your main concern is for your family. That's good, you know, altruism right there. I like that. And so on. And so they have this conversation and the story is just about their conversation. And I don't think it's overstating it that like, Throughout that story, I come up, I, I, I explain how karma works and what the meaning of life is. So I think, you know, it's... In a thousand fairly, words, yeah. Fairly ambitious. You um, should have got a degree for just doing yeah, that. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> 42, no. Um, but I, uh, but um, in the story, I wrote it as um, it's, it's told in the second person form. And so it, it, the story, the first line of the story is, you were on your way home when you died. You know, it was a car crash. Your body was so utterly shattered and da-da-da-da-da. And the first person narrator is God. He's like, that's when you met me, you know. And he's like, are you God, you said? Yes, I said, I'm God. You know, and so the narrator is God, but it's told in second person. You were blah, blah, you, you, you. And there's a reason for that that comes up later. But um, in the, it, lots of people have made their own video versions of the egg. And um, they all have their own different take on it and stuff like that. Um, but the one that's probably the best one is this a couple, of, uh, like a British group who yep. made it. And God is this cool kind of old man with ice yep. cream. He's like, here you go. Yeah. And um, they named they named the the guy who died. They named him Andy. But I never name him in the story. Okay. He's just called you. But the key about that and uh, is that somehow the guy named Andy, is also sort of the generator of the universe and the generator of humanity. So I well, thought that was kind of cool. That, that was, they were sort it was of. an homage to you about the origin <laughs> of humanity from Andy. So yeah, with that. I get a lot of emails with people asking me if, if I believe that that is true. Because the, the egg has these like 
religious connotations and philosophical stuff like that. And it's about what happens when you die. And I get email people, you know, people email me thinking like, oh, you know, I've had these thoughts myself. This might be true. And I'm like, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I do not believe in this. I am not L. Ron Hubbard. I am not here to make a religion. <laughs> <laughs> but you do create amazing worlds that have uh, the, uh, all kinds of science and really interesting and compelling characters, and we and we love what you've done. And thank oh, you thank so you. much for joining us. So. Thank you. So, Q and A time. Uh, have a few. Uh, we have a t time for some audience questions here in the back there. Uh, Greg, did you? We've got we've got handheld mics. People yeah. wandering about. Yeah. So you said that you liked uh, Heinlein up until he got weird. Yeah. And I, I'm a big Heinlein fan, and I'm just curious where you draw the weird line. I would say I would say right around Stranger in a Strange Land. Oh, okay, way earlier than me. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, for well, so I didn't really like Stranger in a Strange Land that much, and I think that puts me in a minority. But like, I just I was like, wait, what? No, what? And so, yeah. I, but I love the early stuff. I mean, it's some of my favorite writing. Tunnel in the Sky is one of my favorite books of all time. Thank you. In the back there. Hi, yeah. So, Andy, I read The Martian just like three months ago. I just read Artemis like right when it came out. So I don't know much about you except for the books and then what I've seen today. But it seems like you have a lot of your own personality in these protagonists. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, and as most authors, you know, tend to have in some way, shape, or form. Every main character is somebody the author wants to be or someone the author wants to screw. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> that, that was a David. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, my question is, why do you think it is that we as readers tend to just like these characters that are clearly really smart, but you know, are are and are also internally motivated, but on the outside just kind of and pardon my phrasing, but just like degas about you know the world. Um, I think people uh, people really enjoy seeing extremely competent people do their thing. Like that's a common theme that you will you'll find. You know, it's like anything from like Top Gun to like House MD to any of these stories about people who are extremely good at what they do doing it, and you get to watch that. And I don't know what it is within us that makes that so entertaining, but that's a thing that appeals to a large demographic, me, myself included, myself especially, I love that. And that's like the West Wing is another example of like all these people are the very best at what they do. And um, so I, I think that the idea of like, uh, people liked Watney because he's like, well, he's an astronaut, so he was already like, really good at what you do. And then you see the whole thing, I've, I've heard it described as confidence porn. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Down here. Hey, um, you have an amazing dedication in Artemis to every single command module pilot who never got to walk. And you named all of the rendezvous ships for them. And yeah. not only do I want to thank you, I want to ask you how you just got there because Naming well, them for Gordon Warden. Yeah, college. I always just everything was beautiful. I always feel tell them what a command that. module pilot is. Okay, so the, it, it, every um, Apollo mission that went to the moon from Apollo Eleven forward had had three astronauts. Uh, two of them landed on the moon. One of them stayed aboard the command module to keep it to keep it in check while the other two were on the moon. So uh, each Apollo mission, each from Eleven onward, had someone who stayed aboard the ship and never landed on the moon. So while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were walking on the moon, Michael Collins was up in the ship. And there's an interesting picture of like, I, I've seen it online where it shows Earth in the background and um, the, the lunar module has separated yeah. and, and it says, every human being who was alive in 19, in, on July 20th, 1969 is in this photo except Michael Collins. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every human being who ever was. Uh, yeah, yes. everyone ever was yeah. alive, right. Yeah. And, and so um, I just thought that those guys took the same risks. They, had, they took the same risks. They did the same hardships. They did the same everything. But I feel like they don't really get the same credit. So I dedicated the book to them. Also, within the, within the fictional world of Artemis, um, 
the bubbles, as they're called, Artemis is a series of spheres, half underground, half above, so it looks like domes, but it's, they go underground too, and they're called bubbles, and each bubble is named after a, a moonwalking astronaut. So, and, and in the, as they build new bubbles, they name them after the next guy who walked on the moon. So it's like the first bubble they build is called Armstrong. The second one they build is called Aldrin. Then it's Conrad, Bean, Shepard, and that's where it is in the story. If they build another one, it'd be Mitchell, and so on. The transfer vessels, the space hotels that you take to go to and from the moon are named like the Collins, and, the, and so on, the, the Warden, the Rusa, and so on. So, good job, a very nice question. Over here. Uh, how, did, how did you feel about the additions to the Martian movie at the end where he's teaching? Oh, I liked that because um, in a film you really need sort of an epilogue. You need, you need to give the audience an opportunity to, ah, okay, I want to see him being happy at home for a little bit. <laughs> and so that's, they, they, they put a lot of work into that. They, Drew, who wrote the screenplay, Drew Goddard, he, went, he struggled with that. He's like, wait, should we do this? Should we do this? Should we end it here? Should we end it there? They had a few different ideas for endings. There was an, there was an alternate ending scene where, that you can see on the DVD or you know, Blu-ray extras where he's aboard Hermes and kind of looking out the window as they return to Earth, and you can see Earth in the distance, but they, and he's thinking about it, and it's just that kind of every human being has a basic instinct to help each other out speech. That's at the end of the book. Um, but they decided to go with the classroom thing just because they figured if we're going to show them coming back, let's show them all the way back. Let's show them on the ground. Back there, Greg. You said you considered yourself a screw-up at 26, so I wanted to ask why, and then how did you become so successful? And, <laughs> and, when, yeah. and how did you know you were successful? Uh, well, one of my main problems, so... Sign up for the Economy Academy class, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, one of my big problems was just, uh, I just wasn't taking care of myself properly. I mean, just, I, 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 I kind of went through a period of depression and then later on, I had really chronic anxiety. It's a problem. I'm very open about these things, so this is not new information. But I just wouldn't, you know, I, I, I just wouldn't take care of myself, and I had no ambition. I would just, you know, work menial jobs just to make enough money to barely scrape by instead of really trying to pursue a real career and stuff. And I, I finally got my crap together, but later than most people do. I think probably around 30 is when I really started to kind of be a human. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, as a math teacher um, and science teacher, we use your scenes from obviously the Martian at, like all the time to kind of motivate students in terms of just getting them excited about solving problems and how do you keep moving forward. Um, how did you decide to like add that into the story? Well, it's the only way I know how to tell a story. I mean. It's, it's just basically the scientific accuracy was, I mean, The Martian is just a series of algebra word problems, right? <laughs> it's one prolonged cascade failure that Mark Watney is constantly <laughs> dealing with. And, um, and like I said, like the, the laziest approach to coming up with a science fiction uh, universe is to just use real physics because whatever problem Mark runs into, real physics knows the answer. If I need to find out how much water it takes to grow potatoes in Martian soil, by God, I can find that out. Or where you find the nitrogen for it. Or where yeah. you get the nitrogen, yeah. yeah. That's right. Over here? Well, it came from Mark, indirectly. <laughs> and, here? and yeah, and then, and then Curiosity ruined it. Yeah. Curiosity ruined it. Those yeah. bastards at JPL. So on the Martian, when I wrote the Martian, the, the prevailing belief among everybody was that Mars was completely bone dry, maybe with a little bit of water at the poles. And then I write The Martian, and it's in the print production pipeline, too late to change anything. And, you know, Curiosity lands on Mars and takes a scoop of soil and goes like, hey, there's a crap load of water in here. <laughs> Turns out every cubic meter of Martian soil, which should technically be called Regolith, but I refuse, <laughs> every cubic meter of Martian soil has 35 liters of water ice in it. Right. So Mark didn't need to blow himself up with hydrazine. He just needed to heat up some dirt. <laughs> Oh, well. well. But it shows how quickly we're constantly learning new things about Mars. A lot of people incorrectly think, oh, we know, we know everything we need to know. No, it's like these extremely basic things we're still learning, really, like, just, like, within the past few years. Uh, just a short question. So, 
are the books set in the same universe, different timelines, or just different universes entirely? Um, could, could be. <laughs> <laughs> Might even be a reference to the Martian in Artemis hidden in there, yeah. if you look close enough. <laughs> Dr. Zamara? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I was been recently very impressed with is Scott Kelly, having spent a, a year, year in orbit, uh, coming back and somehow breaking through the normal NASA Stonewall and being able to tell people just how bad it was. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's horrible. I mean, the effects of long-term zero-G. So I suspect your question is going to be, let's talk about the effects of long-term one-six-G. Well, so <laughs> in whether it's Elon or, you know, NASA's plans to get to Mars, um, I mean, it's, is, is there going to be some level of artificial gravity? I have to believe there will be. Um, and I think that if, if we want to do a, 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 if we want to put humans on Mars, we absolutely have to invent, well, it's not even invent, but just implement centripetal gravity. And, uh, you know, I, I actually, so for reasons passing understanding, the Congressional Subcommittee on, the U.S. House of Representatives Subcommittee on Space, like, summoned me to testify. <laughs> and I did with a bunch of other, well, with a bunch of space experts. So it's like expert, 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 Raider, you know. <laughs> and everybody made their, and they were, we were all asked to tell them, the subcommittee, what we think uh, the most important, what, what we think NASA should be working on. And everybody had their own answer, and my answer was uh, centripetal gravity. So my, uh, and the reason I believe that is because, I mean, it remains to be seen how we would get humans to Mars. If you just did a traditional chemical thrust, it would be an eight-month home and transfer. If you have ion engines, you might be able to get there faster. But one way or another, you're going to spend months and months in that spacecraft. And if you spend, you know, eight months or five months or whatever in zero G, and then you try to walk out onto the surface of Mars with like 50 kilograms of gear on, you're just going to go. Um, and so that's why I think that you need a centrifuge, you just need the ship and some basic mass. It doesn't have to be some gigantic monstrous wheel in space. It can be. Um, we like gigantic monstrous I wheels in space. I know we like Come gigantic on. monstrous wheels in space. Yeah. But you can have basically pods at the end of like um, Xylon <laughs> ropes that just, the whole thing just spins. Sure. Well, in fact, even uh, uh, a, a priority NASA uh, human performance issue right now is literally your eyeballs change shape in weight. Well, there's a lot of problems with zero G. So first off, there's the ones that everybody knows about. Sure. There's uh, the fact that you lose bone density, you lose muscle density, your heart gets weaker. But all of those things fix themselves once you get back to normal gravity. Your, the bones go back to their original density. Your muscles, you, you, build back, you build back up your bulk. Your heart gets stronger again, presuming you don't have any physical problems to start with. Um, however, um, because in zero gravity, your eyes change shape and it messes with the blood flow, the capillaries in your retina, and you undergo macular degeneration, and that does not get better. So your eyesight is permanently damaged, getting worse and worse and worse as you spend time in zero G. So we actually have our, our Clark Center a proposal working on the vision changes for uh, oh, cool. for now. Uh, where are we next? Uh, over here? A little farther back there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, at the back. He's got the mic. Go ahead. How did you get the idea for the Martian? How did I get the idea for the Martian? Well, um, so I love to like. Uh, think through scientific scenarios. I like, so like for instance, I designed the entire city of Artemis, how they built it, how they did all this stuff like that before I came up with any plot or characters. Um, for The Martian, I wasn't even intending to write a book. I was just sitting down thinking, how could we put people on Mars? Okay, how do we get the astronauts there? How do we get them back? What's my, how do I basically update the Mars Direct plan to account for like new technology like ion engines and stuff like that? And and, um, and so I, I kind of worked on that just for fun. It wasn't like I was making a book or planning to publish anything. I was just like, yeah, this is a fun thing to think about. And then I'm like, okay, what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if these two things go wrong at the same time? How do we make sure the crew doesn't die? All this kind of failure analysis, kind of come up with a mission plan that accounts for it. And 
I realized that the increasingly desperate things you would have to do to survive these problems might make for a good story. So I created an unfortunate protagonist and subjected him to all of it. For <laughs> so I am a so petty god. Does he still have the mic back there? So what did you think of the Martian? I was uh, great to. Oh, well, um, I only saw the movie, unfortunately. It's OK. <laughs> That's the movie fine. is good. It's a really good adaptation. So was it fun? Did you like it? Yeah. Lots of profanity in the book. Just yeah, saying, you might like yeah. it. I, Just put your mom's ears over your ears. That's right. I, well, there I hope to read it, and um, I thought the movie was really good. So. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. This one here? For the teachers out there, um, there is also a classroom-friendly edition that has all the, <laughs> no, really, that has the swear words replaced with PG swear words. <laughs> Okay, so first off, I was really struck by like the, the, the amount of realism that was located in both books. Thanks. So, yeah, so like just one question, like I guess sort of the, a common theme like in science fiction is kind of like it, it revolves around like, you know, sp space warfare. So basically, like, I'm, this may not be your passion area, but like, you know, how would you approach like, you know, fleshing out a, I guess, a story idea like that's around the, the idea of like space combat? Well, um, that is definitely not my area. Um, but I, I believe any space con by the time we're having conflicts in space, the conflicts will probably be entirely with drones. So it'll really be like a really expensive game of space invaders for both sides. <laughs> it'll be like, you know, side A will have pilots in safe places fighting side B's pilots who are also in safe places, and one side or the other will eventually run out of drones because they didn't have as much money or the, whatever. And so it'd be like, It'd be kind of neat, actually. Maybe I will write a book. That's not a bad kind. <laughs> it'd be neat because, like, it'd be a war where nobody dies. It'd just be like I, I could title it "War is Heck." <laughs> Wasn't there a Star cool Trek concept. episode like that? Well, no. That one. That that one. They do die. Mm. It's just the computer tells you when you have to die. Um, uh, but actually, you've touched on a point that we had intended to talk about: the difference between the optimistic and pessimistic. Yes, of course. Um, um, I feel that like a lot of science fiction these days has been kind of hijacked by these dismal dystopian views of the future. And that's not my view of the future. I just don't think that's going to happen. I, I, I think that if you look at all of human history, for the most part, if you pick any century, if you say, like, imagine someone living in that century, that person would be worse off if they were a century earlier and would be better off if they were a century later. So humanity just, we just keep making life better. We notice it really, really, we really notice it when we're bad to each other. But humans being good to each other is so such the standard norm that it kind of goes unnoticed. Like creating a school or a like, hospital. Yeah, sure. right. I mean, it's like progress happens, and, and I believe 100 years from now, people would be like, oh, hell no, I wouldn't want to live back then. I, I believe that we keep getting better. And there's also a lot of, like, in my opinion, technophobia in these stories where the idea is, oh, any technology that gets invented is just going to lead directly to like either the end of mankind or miserable oppression or something like that. And I'm just not, I just don't have that view. So I tend to, I, I, I like the good old days of science <laughs> fiction where technology is awesome and makes everybody's life better and the conflicts come from other sources. Okay, so just a couple of quick questions left. One at the back there. So what do you do when you get writer's block? Um, I don't really get writer's block. What I get is writer's laziness. <laughs> I've got enough ideas to, uh, I've got enough ideas for books and stories to last me the rest of my life. I will, I will run out of lifespan before I, before I run out of stories. Um, but uh, sometimes I'm just like, oh, I don't want to write. I know exactly what I need to do. I just don't want to do it. And so that's just nose to the grindstone, get it done. But one bit of, <coughs> one bit of advice I, I heard, and I wish I could remember who said it, because I, I, I would like to uh, attribute it to them. It was an author. Uh, they said, like, sometimes when you're, um, when you're writing, it might have been David, I don't know. <laughs> no, no. But sometimes when you're writing, it's, it flows really well, and it's just cranking out. You get thousand, uh, several thousand words out in a day, and you're just like, oh, yeah, that was great. And other times, it's an absolute miserable slog. It's like every word is torture. Every sentence is, oh, God. But later on, 
if you wait six months and go back and read it, you can't tell the difference between the parts that were easy to write and the parts that mm. were hard to write. And that's encouraging to me when I'm going through one of those rough patches where I'm like, all right, this is rough, but it's not throwaway. I am making progress. I, I, the quality of my writing is just as good when I'm hating doing it as when I love doing it. Wow. <laughs> and so that's, that's what I run into. One last question. So, but since oh. you're thinking about the regolith issue, and I, I just popped the up regolith my head. issue. You know, wait, why wait. not just use a water pressure wash? Yeah, so I thought about that. I thought about that too. Um, I thought I, I figured I figured air would be enough. He's mm -hmm. here to tell me it's not. But uh, you know, make your own moon city. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Andy, thank you so much. It's really uh, fabulous having you here. We love your books and your comments. And, oh, thank you, and, Double Doctor. Uh, we're really excited about the, another movie coming. We're, uh, well, Fox we're, has uh, the film rights. We'll, well see if they make a movie out of it. That'd be great, yes. <laughs> Don't get too excited. A lot of stuff has to go right. So, uh, for, so, so for those of you who are interested, uh, The Mysterious Galaxy, our uh, co-sponsor for this evening, uh, has books for uh, Andy to sign for us. And since I've experienced this myself, being a super fan, coming to the front of the line and waiting a long time, what I'm going to ask is that if, you're, if you uh, have to go, and uh, please, please go ahead. But we'll let, why don't we let the people from the front uh, head up to the book, uh, the book lines. And uh, if you can give everybody a chance who came in order, the front gets the, gets the chance to the book line. Oh, well, also, That's I will That's because I have a last name with V, so I'm, I've okay. always been at the back of the line. <laughs> well, it, I have a last name starts with W, so I there understand. Um, I, will I will finish the line however long it is. So Thank if you're you. way at the back, don't worry. You'll. Andy Hill. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you that much. was really fabulous. Thank you.